Kenyans, there's no Kenyan who is involved. Mm -hmm. But they are just in our premises. They're, they're, they're in premises owned by Kenyans or in the Kenyan land. Mm -hmm. Uh, you see, there's something that uh, it, gives, it also gave a bad implication that we are really out of control of, uh, of, of ourselves and our security. Because foreigners are coming in into our country. When they come in, they are getting into our premises. Other foreigners are coming in foreign vehicles to, to, uh, to, to uh, quote unquote, uh, what they were using, abduct. Uh, a foreigner. You, you see, we are in Catch-22 in such a situation. Mm -hmm. So it uh, leaves a lot of gaps unattended too. And um, even if the PS tried to attend, but he, he tried his best and at least uh, we got to understand what was happening because we did not as expect such a visitor to be humiliated in, in such a way, to be taken through what he went through. But there are also gaps <coughs> between the Kenyan government, the Ugandan government, and uh, whoever is uh, responsible, uh, responsible to make sure that when our visitors come to Kenya, they've not come to, obviously, quote unquote, they have not come to, they, they are not harmful to us. So with this, somebody should be able to scrutinize and uh, know the intent of the people visiting. So those people did not uh, come up and uh, give us the assurance of that. Mm -hmm. So we have many gaps. There are gaps in Uganda, there are gaps in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And then we are letting these foreigners come and handle our visitor our hands off what's happening, the Ministry of Interior, you know, they, they, there's so much that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, Wakili, I'll come to you on that because this comes um, uh, when the government has been criticized over the cases of uh, what has been seen as abductions and uh, maybe clamping down on free speech. So where does that leave uh, the government and does it also, the, the incident, the message incident, does it in any way hurt the diplomatic relations between the two countries? Well, uh, I think the contextual issue arising here is um, the breach of uh, protocol, as explained. I yes. think Kenya is trying to exonerate itself from responsibility. Uh, two issues that come to mind. One is uh, for such an issue to happen, there is an administrative process involved. You cannot walk into a country and extract someone from that country on account one of the principle of sovereignty and the right of hot pursuit. Um, the right of hot pursuit is the right of a country to pursue an aggressor in, a, in another country mm -hmm. using its force. The right of hot pursuit crystallizes when the security of the country is threatened. The right of hot pursuit did not avail itself for Uganda in this context. And therefore what remains is the administrative aspect which then if somebody, if an OCS from Nairobi wants somebody from Kisi, for instance, mm -hmm. wants to arrest someone from Kisi, he notifies the police in Kisi, and therefore the administrative element of extracting that person from Kisi is then um, excited. In a sense, therefore, uh, you have to look to involve the local administration of the police uh, in that area for you to, able to, to execute that, any arrest. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there are those uh, fiefdoms, uh, administrative fiefdoms in the country. For purpose of e extra uh, or, or, or um, jurisdictions that cross a, a, a cut across countries, it's, it's even more complicated because mm -hmm. you have to move. If you're moving officially into a country as a security officer, you don't just move, you involve the Interpol. You involve um, an international mechanism for extraction of that person. And therefore, uh, the, I think the parties that will be involved are mm -hmm. the host countries, uh, which is Kenya. Yes. Kenya, therefore, will have to compromise um, <clears throat> its, 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 its um, administration of that person mm -hmm. uh, for purposes of giving pro um, the custody of that person to foreigners, yes. uh, that is Ugandans, for Ugandans to uh, get the person into their custody and extract him from the country. Let me cut it short. Fast forward, therefore. Let me cut it short. We go for a break, then you'll continue on that point. Thank you. Don't go too far. This is KBC Channel 1. Welcome back to Good Morning Kenya. My name is Mike Megui. And um, before we went on a break, Wakili, you were talking about the incidences of um, uh, abductions. May, if you may continue on that point. 
Yes, and therefore, uh, you, you, if you point out, if you look at the administrative aspect on what happened, mm -hmm. it's therefore clear that um, there was um, there's an element of assistance that Uganda got from Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, there's acquiescence, in a sense, agreeing to what Uganda wanted to do. And uh, uh, number three is uh, those, uh, basically Kenya complemented Uganda in that extraction. It, it can't be that Uganda used force and extracted the person without the administrative aspect um, being supported from Kenyan side. Um, having said that, uh, was it legal, was it illegal? I think it's a context of a, um, uh, an argument, but the truth of the matter is the host country ought to have protected uh, the subject that was in, this, uh, in the country mm -hmm. and uses other extradition means, including law, the process of law, upon which Sabu can be extradited to the other country, and not in the manner that um, that was done. Um, the other issue is, uh, again, about Uganda uh, ex explaining the justification on whether, or on why it had to abduct, not abduct, basically arrest. I think uh, <laughs> it's sensational to say abduct. We know abduction has been ha happening in this country over the time. Uh, the subject of the country, others are killed. Yes, that, that is a debate we're having in this country. Mm -hmm. But this was not an abduction. It, it was basically an arrest by a foreign country to its subject. Uh, upon his subject. But um, having arrested him and taken him to Uganda, they're saying he's in possession of, you know, pistols. Uh, I've not looked at, at Ugandan law on account of treason or illegal possession of firearms, but two pistols as an aggression against government with machine guns and helicopters, which is fighting in Sudan, which is fighting in Congo, and one subject like that can threaten government. I think it's a political issue being settled in Uganda, and unfortunately, that is inviting Kenya into the mix. Uh, we shouldn't have participated in that. But uh, uh, Kenya has a robust constitutional movement. Uh, I think next time, I if we can, in such a situation, we ought to do better. We've hosted uh, subjects of, of, um, um, you know, of, of questions such as in, in, in before, including Museven himself, He's been hosted in this country uh, many years ago when he was an aggressor or subject of such aggression uh, before. And, and, and it went in peace. We, we, didn't, we didn't have any uh, conflict with other countries on that account. And, and others, even in this country, uh, the South Sudan um, SPLM movement has been hosted here as many times. Uh, so has the Somalia uh, issues. In fact, some meetings have been hosted here and, you would, and many other countries. So I, I do not see why this uh, had to become an urgency of sorts in, to, to, to be uh, conferred in terms of implementation administratively in the month that it did. But, but again, um, there are things that we know and we will know, but those things that uh, which are uh, obviously under subject of oath of secrecy, uh, they call it national security. Mm -hmm. So they may never be revealed to us uh, for now, uh, and, and that is also protected in law. But that which has been revealed to us, I don't think makes sense. Uh, but it has been, it has happened what has happened. I think Ugandans can deal with their issues. We have our issues to deal with, but not to be sick. Um, it, it's just that I think constitutionally we seem not to uphold it uh, in terms of protection, protecting ourselves, but also anybody or on earth or on the Kenyan earth. Uh, what it means, uh, because the constitution protects not just Kenyans, any human being in Kenya is also under the protection of the constitution. So I, I think we should uphold it in all fours uh, are not subjected only selectively and when it, it matters for us. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's look at what is um, uh, reported on the front page of the star. Raila wants 10 PSs as a Ruto plans to shuffle. President looking to accommodate allies in a broad-based government ahead of 2027 polls. That story is told on page 6 of the star. And the photo splashed on the front page is Besige, uh, who was taken into um, court martial at Makindie, where he was arraigned after he was kidnapped at Riverside Drive in Nairobi and forcibly returned to Uganda. U Uganda. Uh, Oscar, the president is looking to accommodate new allies in a broad-based government uh, before or ahead of 2027. Why is it? Why is this necessary for? Him? I, I, I think I think it is something on the in the right direction, mm -hmm. and this one has happened before. Uh, I think even uh, you know currently, 
somehow uh, President William Ruto will be running an popular government because I told you the credibility of his administration was tested by the JNZ's uh, revolution mm -hmm. and uh, now attempt. Some people describe it as an attempt coup. The same, same thing, this is two years after his election. This one happened in 2005 also. When Mwai Kibaki took power in 2002, mm -hmm. then exactly after two years, we had to go for a referendum, which the government lost when we lost uh, the Wako draft. In, uh, you remember when uh, Raila and uh, the rest uh, campaigned against the Wako draft, and the, 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 which was government draft. That was a, like a vote of no confidence mm -hmm. in that government. But Mwai Kibaki had to uh, remove the entire cabinet, do a new cabinet to help him finish that first term. He did something called uh, Government of National Unity, I think, uh, when he brought in a chai and the rest, to help him finish that. Because the credibility of his government had been tested. Again, I think in 1982, something like this, an attempt coup, 1982, again as President Moy, mm -hmm. who had been elected in 19, who had been, who had been uh, president from 1979 after, after the death of Jomo Kenyatta, mm -hmm. then uh, the, the Chukas of the world and blah, 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 attempted a coup, and uh, this station was raided, and uh, power was seemed to be, they were trying to take power here when that Mambo Potella was uh, announcing news in this premise that we are in today. Mm -hmm. When that one happened again, President Moi tried to reorganize his government to have something different. So I think what William Ruto is doing is not new. Something that has happened before. That you try, even Uru Kenyatta, when he's, he's going for his second term, he tried to organize government by having a handshake with Raila. Moi Kibaki, when they brought in the Grand Coalition after the 202, after the 207 general election, he did it twice actually. Moi Kibaki did it twice. In 205, when he... Uh, sacked all his cabinet ministers and replaced them with others. Then again in 2007, when there was uh, the post election violence in 2007, and had to bring in Raila Odinga and another set of half of the cabinet, which were members of the opposition, who had quote-unquote lost the election. So again, he had to change policies to suit whatever was happening at that particular time. This is what William Ruto is trying to do. That he has to, after the JNZs and after the impeachment of Gashagua, it's like he's trying to reorganize his government. Because he wants deliverables. He's going to face an election. For instance, if you ask me, the issue of uh, NHIF and, uh, and, and the chief and Shah, and Shah, this one. Nakumicha, according to me, lost health docket because she was not able to, first of all, deal with, uh, with the doctor's strike, and secondly, implement the chief uh, insurance. Uh -huh. So when you brought in the new cabinet secretary, uh, what is her name again, Beraza, she just went and implemented the way it was. Because like her position was like, because if I was Beraza, I could have told the president, look, wait a minute. This thing, the way it is structured, it might bring a lot of teething problems which you don't want to deal with. And if, because you want to use this one as a political tool, as you campaign in 2027, give it a break, let's give it another three months, so that I also internalize this one, get new, better structure, so that by the time we implement it, I don't think it was a bad thing, but I think it has serious teething problems, which is raising a lot of eyebrows. For instance, I will explain to you. When President William Ruto was campaigning for this shifting, he categorically said that Yule Mutu na Lipaga Miatano will now be paying 300 shillings, right? Which people were comfortable. Those, the, the people who were paying 500, if you reduce it to 300, they were, okay, this is the right thing to do. But now, they're now complaining that if you get to register in that portal, then that portal gets you a fee that you're supposed to pay. There are people who are paying 500 per month, but now the portal is telling them to pay 3,000. Some are being told to pay 1,200. Some are being told to pay 1,600. You know, this somebody who was told that you'd be paying 300. But now the portal decides because of the narration you give the portal. Mm -hmm. Then in that narration, the portal decides how much you're going to pay. Mm -hmm. So you end up paying a sum that you don't know, you, you didn't plan for, which is a problem for the people. I think this one is going to mess his re-election. But you know, in politics, what you normally do, I always say, 
you take five promises, only five, mm -hmm. then implement two. Like, for example, President Moe Kibaki took a lot, I think, including free primary education. Mm -hmm. And implemented free primary education well. So, you know, you stick to that one that actually I, I said I will implement five, but there were things that I could not implement because of the situation. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I did this one. One time when uh, Tony Blair, I think Tony Blair was elected to become the Prime Minister of uh, England, of, of, of the UK, he was asked by the media that now you've been elected the Prime Minister, what are you going to do for the English people? And uh, he said, that the first thing we're going to do, uh -huh. we have to go back to the English people uh -huh. and tell them that among the promises we made, these are achievable and these are not achievable, uh -huh. number one. Because we have to go back. Then we say 10 things, but otherwise, only five are achievable. So, you know, you become believable when you do such a thing. But if we cannot even implement this shift thing, I'm wondering how will we go, William Butro, face the people in 2027 mm. without a strong policy like the health, you know, is this is something so dear to the people. Uh -huh. Again, at the time that the people are facing such a thing, there's a crisis of, li or crisis of living. Cost of living has really gone up. Mm -hmm. With now the introduction, which we are introducing again, we are introducing the amendment. You know very well that this week we are introducing the amendment of the finance, uh, finance bill uh, 2024, the amendment that the, the government is trying to get another 178 billion. Now, again, taxes, there are more taxes that are being added mm -hmm. to uh, the system. Now, the cost of the spending, people are, not sp people are not able to spend because salaries are coming down. It's like salaries are coming down, but the cost of living is going up, which is a, mix, a, a mismatch. And this is what is, uh, according to me, even the, the, the pastors who are complaining, they're really not complaining about whatever is happening. You know that Kenyans are not even spending on tithing and, and sadakas anymore because people want to eat. And people feel the pain that the, the, the money is not able to buy anymore. Mm -hmm. So we need radical decisions. For example, if I will be somebody who is trying to help the president achieve a few things towards the election, mm -hmm. just remove things like VAT and, and, and a lot of taxes on, uh, on f food, for mm -hmm. example. The people are able to eat energy, cost of electricity. Remove tax on that one. <coughs> Because it is expensive for the people. And the belt is, more is tightening even more. So I'm even worried about 2025, how will it be? Because we are tightening it more and more. I think we should have a system where we bring a lot of people into the tax bracket, but reduce tax. Mm -hmm. So that many people, I think Mwai Kibaki's government focused on that. Mm -hmm. He was not so focused on taxing. He was focused on bringing so many people to the tax bracket. Mm -hmm. And many people, and reducing the tax brings so many people, and you can achieve still whatever you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. But in our case, you find that the tax bracket is shrinking because big, big, big companies are not, are, not, are not paying tax. Some of them are evading tax. Even the, the issue of, uh, of, of, of the churches, again, the way I look at it, you know, there was, uh, there was a, uh, Mungatana was trying to bring in a bill so that uh, the offering in church can be taxed. That is wrong. I think you should not tax the offering. <laughs> yeah. But I still think that the businesses that are run by these organizations should pay taxes. For example, hospitals, for example, schools, for example, any other business like other, other you know, churches own uh, malls in town. There is one, I think, I think I've seen one at Basilica, Cardinal Tunga. You know, those ones, the businesses that are run by these organizations should be subjected to attacks. But offering that is in, you know, you're going to go, it's difficult to go into, the KRA going into uh, the, 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 the final accounts of churches to say, okay, this is how much you collected, you pay VAT on this and this and this. That one might be a bit tricky. But the businesses that are run by this organization should be subjected to some, some tax because they earn income and they earn rent on them, they earn a lot of, uh, it, it, it is business. All right. Mm. Um, Can I just comment on that about the, the tax, what yes. you just said? You know, <coughs> what, uh, what you should remember is any tax on anyone, be it somebody is handling a private um, health facility or to schools, if tax is going to subject it to them, you know, these are people doing business. Yes. So what that means, it is getting subjected to the end consumer. And who is the consumer? Yeah. The sick people, yeah. those, uh, those going to school. And um, it is still going to raise 
even the cost of living even higher. But so there's no way out. You can, uh, uh, you can talk of an entity in isolation. You know, even if you talk about the church uh, itself paying tax to the government, you know what that means? It goes to the people. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, I'll not be doing business, and then according to you, you are going to subject tax to me. Let's say, for example, even if I'm, uh, if I'm a landlady, you're not going to subject tax to me because the idea of me building my apartment was for me to make money. So when you come up with the new ideas of taxes, what does that mean? My rent has to go up because ideally I have to get my money back. But you get, you know, we, we, what we call income tax is that it is the money that you receive. For example, if you do a mall uh -huh. in the middle of town, be it a private mall, be it a, you know, you're going to get an income out of it. And that is what government tax is called, income tax. Income is when you receive an income in terms of salary. Mm -hmm. Pay as you earn. When you no, pay we, as you earn. We understand all that. Yeah, income yeah. tax, yeah. pay as you earn. Yeah, but you no, know, that is, yeah, do do this is, this is within our understanding. Yes. And uh, when I say that, it is with that one uh, considered in it. Yeah, yeah. You know, naturally, you know, we are not, um, we are not an utopian. You know, we are yes. Kenyans. Yes, yes. And we want to maximize on profits. Yeah. So there's no way out you're going to introduce new stuff. I'm used to, this is what I'm paying, and then you're coming to introduce new taxes I will to go me and, survive without and taxes. expect me to still leave these people financing my business yes. and they still leave it as so a So you, 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 you don't for paying taxes? Wakili, Wakili, let, let me, let me rationalize to... that. Um, I think it's a good debate out there. Yes. Um, in law, the principle in law is you don't uh, tax charity. If, if you and me meet and um, um, somebody's getting married, mm -hmm and we're assisting in a pre-wedding or whatever, you don't tax that money. You don't tax uh, Harambe for education. You, there are things that you don't tax. Because the social element must be grown uh, to be able to organize the people in their own way for purposes of encouraging charity because that's what um, basically organizes uh, the social, the context of social edifice. Now, if you, 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 you extend, you look at the elasticity of charity, churches um, are organizations that organize people within religious um, contexts. Um, they then uh, get money, collect money from people, and again, um, invest the money in such, such that their intention, probably in education and helping the people, the poor outreach programs, are facilitated further by uh, the investment that they make. So that money is not basically for purposes of, you know, you know um, business for profit. It's business so that it, is, it goes back to the charitable intentions mm -hmm. of that organization. That's why I in law we have something we call companies limited by shares, companies limited by guarantee. <coughs> Those limited by guarantee are supposed to <coughs> file returns on account of the char charitable returns that they make. So you realize that, yes, context is different. You can build a mall, but you can still be bankrupt even if you don't have a mall. The reason is the money that comes in ha supports so many institutions like schools and churches. Uh, and therefore, eventually, uh, this tax bracket will not probably be served better uh, because this money comes from the same people. You'll realize that expansion of a tax bracket need not necessarily go to such charitable organizations. You just need to bring many, like I'm a good friend said, men to the fold, and then lower the taxation levels so that as many uh, as possible pay to the same pool, but very little. Remember, um, you can gain a lot of money. I saw the Gen Z's the other day raised, I think, 20 million mm -hmm. within a day or so. On, on the few of the little monies that they were contributing. Yes. That is what is important. That's what taxation would be. Many, many people uh, contribute in small amounts uh, to the big amounts that we're looking for, the billions that we're looking at. <laughs> the joke with Kenyans was, give us uh, the debt outstanding for Kenya abroad. We will contribute, and one day we're going to pay it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that then we are free from debt. It was an argument, of course, uh, in jest. But the point remains that uh, if we contribute uh, as much as possible, 
but a little amount that, which is contribution of tax mm -hmm. into the same pool, mm -hmm. then we'll have a lot of money. That, that's really uh, the rationale that, that should be. So sometimes, yes, you tax because of the urgency mm -hmm. uh, and go deep into the pockets of the people mm -hmm. to address certain issues. But if you have the comfort, mm -hmm. you will probably address it that way and allow people to pay less, mm -hmm. but pay more and make sure everybody shares into the burden of taxation in the country, which is what we are trying to achieve in this country. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but but, but the, I think the question initially um, that excited this debate, yes. I, I think, was the question of legality and legitimacy. Mm -hmm. You know, um, legality is the law, and that's important. President William Ruto is legally the president of the Republic of Kenya, and there's no debate about it. How he is reorganizing the government in the context of what you said, um, bringing new PSs and so, yeah, is, is trying to buy into legitimacy. Legitimacy, by the way, um, has an element of what the people feel about you and the general national psyche mm -hmm. towards you. So what you need to do is broad-based government was for purposes of um, rendering comfort and the feeling of belonging into government by putting faces and representation into that government uh, to address the issue of the differences and fissures in, in, within society. Context being, for instance, uh, ethnicity, religion, um, there is now a generational element coming to either Gen Z's and, uh, <clears throat> of course, the older uh, generation of the country. So there are many things that you need to meet. It's not easy. So why you reorganize government is to continue to be responsive uh, to the people and remember that I need to be legitimate to the people, uh, notwithstanding that I am uh, legally uh, the, the president. And in that context, therefore, you buy into the people for purposes of addressing their issues, one, and addressing the issue of an election uh, in 2027 in the context in which we... But we, we, will, we, will that work? Will that work? Will uh, that work? Let, let me tell you this. Whether it works or not, it must be done. Because remember, there was a reconstitution of government right from cabinet and then the, 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 um, the deputy president. Uh, fast forward is, there are those elements, therefore, that were not um, loyal. The question of loyalty comes in. Were not loyal to the president because they came from the angle yes. of the deputy president. Uh -huh. That has to be addressed because loyalty and legitimacy uh, at a point meet. Uh, and the fusion of the same will be that those that serve government do not sabotage the government, but serve the government with the intention of delivering for the holder of the office, who is the for, president. For, 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 instance, for instance, you find... The other day I saw the former CS, uh, Moses Kuria, mm -hmm. write a tweet yes. when the Catholic Church were condemning the president. Then Moses Kuria writes a tweet that the Catholic Church are always right, and they will <laughs> always be right, and he is an advisor to the president. You see, that loyalty is not there. He is not he's sabotaging whoever he's working for. Even if you need to, in a good working system, mm -hmm. even if you need to condemn, get away on platforms of doing it. By just doing it on Twitter, I think, for me, that one should not be accepted. Mm -hmm. Number two, Kachagwa was not alone. He had these people who were loyal to him. They're still serving in government. For example, uh, the chairman of the committee of budget. Because the main thing here, even CS Bali, whatever he's doing, is only implementing a budget. And there was a committee that worked on that budget led by Dindi Nyoro, who is also now a bit for Gachagwa at this particular time, and is expected to help implement the same policies that the same government is working on. You know, his mind is also already divided. So I support something like that. You know, check out and weed anybody whom is not acceptable, who is not accepting your policies now, how you want things to work, because your goals are different, including the PSS. The other, whatever you are reading there, as Raila wants... Um, 10 PSS. 10 PSS. I think, how I, 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 think, I think this is out of, out of, out of <laughs> question. Because already, you are bringing a, a, they are bringing a budget towards that. That yeah. means the PSS that will be appointed, mm -hmm. they will never be seen as experts in their own field. But if, you cannot ignore the fact that there is a political, in a way it's a political. Now, if I, I, my, my name is Omondi. Yes. If I'm appointed a PS tomorrow, I'll be seen as a Raila person who has only come <laughs> to fill in the 10, the 10 PSS that Raila <laughs> is trying to, you know, which, 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 which makes it... Af you're starting from a wrong notion. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're not starting from a notion that these guys are going to do some other thing, bringing mm -hmm. ODM. For example, the Mount Kenya, I think, uh, opposition to William Ruto. I don't think the Mount Kenya hates William Ruto. It's not true. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, they just don't like it that um, William Ruto is working around with Raila. Only. And if William Ruto says, I'm not working with Raila anymore, then they become friends again. And Gashago was very clear that we just didn't like, Uru was our man, was our son, and what we hated in him, he didn't work with Raila. So we dumped him. And again, if Ruto works with Raila, we dump him. If Ruto comes back to work with us, now it's okay, he's a good guy. That's it. It's not about any other thing. So even the person writing Raila wants 10 pieces, is just trying to dig into that debate, that debate of that division. Uh -huh. you know? And again, the government must work. And that's yeah. what he's saying. Everybody must be in it. Doctor is dying to know. do I that. Know. <laughs> okay, you know, I want, to, I want to take what you're saying as your opinion, yes. which opinion. can be correct or, yeah. or wrong yeah. in my context. Yes. Um, but I do not agree to it. If you ask me, about uh, Raila wanting the 10 uh, uh, slots for PSS, according to me, there should even be more. Because how are we going to have... Uh, they're already in. The ministers are already in from uh, the, the Raila side. Yes. So it, it is, it, uh, them, him wanting those slots could only be completing the equation. And if you ask me, if we really... You remember the time of uh, Kibaki, the Nusu mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The government worked very well. Mm -hmm. Because if you ask me in this current, uh, this government, mm -hmm. uh, this Kenya Kwanzaa government, if they really want for us to move within the three years, to move really very actively and do stuff for, ours, uh, for the Kenyan citizen, if the minister is uh, Kenya Kwanzaa, the PS should be this. So that it's uh, checks and balances, checks and balances. We are going to have things, the government moving. And then when we say, when we want to build on uh, perceptions, like you're talking about Mount Kenya, they didn't like this person. I think that is promoting tribalism, which we should try by our level best. Because you understand, according to me, okay, you know this, uh, the President Ruto is human, just like any other person. Mm -hmm. There's so much you can handle, there's so much you can... You know when you're under so much pressure, yes. I don't think you can even think straight. Yes. So uh, um, my thinking is, eh, I'm not saying he's a good person. And I'm not saying he's a bad person, because there's no one perfect person. But when we are faced in a situation like this, that is so, in, the, the, our economy is so tattered, is so ununderstood. Mm -hmm. Why don't we avoid the pessimism and they try to inject some kind of positivity into whatever happening that is there, at least to try and get answers, inject at least for education, at least for health. No, let us, okay, there's a lot of negativity around. Mm -hmm. And why, there's a lot of pessimism. Anybody trying to raise a point, you want to raise fingers. If we can try as Kenyans, okay, fine, we are in the, we're in the mud together. You know, you, you, you know, all of us Kenyans were in the mud. Because when things are happening, it's not only the president that is affected. Us, we are the people who are affected down here. The Wanjikos were the ones who are affected. Yeah. So there's a lot of, if we, we as Kenyans can avoid the pessimism yeah. and they try and handle this as, as, uh, in a sober mind. Yes. Because the worst has already happened, I yes. believe, and uh, we don't expect more than what is happening right now. Mm -hmm. So we can have some kind of damage control strategies by avoiding a lot of pessimism and injecting tribalism remarks that are going to make us be apart in, a, in, a, in a, to, to escalate the gaps that yeah. we have. All right. Yeah. Let's take a short break. We'll be right back. Don't go too far. This is Good Morning Kenya. still watching good morning kenya and uh, this is uh, the state of the nation and we continue with the conversation with my panelists that is oscar onyango who is a political analyst dr evelyn ogendo a political analyst and wakili george kithi who is an advocate of the high court there's something about taxation uh, that uh, the cs treasury um there's something he highlighted and he, he said that the government is consider uh, considering lowering uh, pay as you earn over a period of two years. He also said that um, Kenyans need to discuss how to make overall tax manageable. Let me start with you, Akili. What does that mean for the woman Mwananchi? 
lowering uh, pay within a span of two years it's possible mm -hmm. one one of the complaints about our taxation mm -hmm. regime here is it's unpredictable uh, so as an investor assuming um, you, you want to invest in Kenya and you you seek an opinion an expert opinion on the taxation regimes here mm -hmm. you, you will receive uh, very complicated opinions yeah. uh, but the returns won't be very simple yet a taxation regime ought to be the simplest mm -hmm. easily understood and affordable and shared the burden is shared across uh, the reason is you, you know the, there's the what we call a finance act which is the law the primary law but then the finance act uh, is a continued piece of legislation throughout every year mm -hmm. But every year, uh, the context will be we amend the Finance Act mm -hmm. on VAT, on pay as you earn, on all faces um, and streams of taxation, if you will call them that. Um, so there's no consistency. So to, if this year VAT 16% becomes to 18%, goes back 16%, then 18%, and I'm an importer, and I sell wares and goods, uh, I can't therefore plan within that context for like six years or how then my company will grow for 10 or 15 years or what I want it to be mm -hmm. in 50 years. Uh, the, 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 I think paying taxes is agreeable to every Kenyan. Mm -hmm. I've never heard a single Kenyan saying, I, I'm, I don't want to pay taxes, no. What they are saying is, one, it must be predictable. So that then I know in the next three years, I'm gonna do an, this and this project because uh, my finances can be arranged in a certain context. It, it can't be ignored that you, I don't know whether I should use this, but you variegate, you, 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 you probably change the taxation um, uh, percentages uh, and components over time. Uh, say one year you change this, second year you change this. So the, the budgeting con context in this country mm -hmm. seems to be adding, adding or subtracting t um, uh, in in the tax uh, uh, against uh, certain brackets mm -hmm. or, 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 or changing the taxing regime. I do think it's possible to have a constant taxation or tax regime of a period of years for consistency. Meaning, therefore, uh, if you earn a certain amount X at KBC mm -hmm. uh, and you work at KBC for 10 years, you are able to know where you will be in 10 years because the projection of salary growth is, is provided for and the projection of tax uh, implementation is projected for. And therefore, if you take a loan, you are able to subject it to a context of how you're gonna pay it. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't take a loan today, subjecting it into 15 years to come, mm -hmm. knowing that this is the amount you're going to pay, and therefore the income residue for you with a certain amount so that you can fend for your family and pay school fees and so on and so forth, then that is removed away from you, is taken away from you, yet you knew that you are going to contract um, and make arrangements uh, within a context of a financial arrangement imposed on you by, by, by government. Mm -hmm. So I do think it, 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 is, it, is, it is true we must tax, but I think we must settle at a certain point and allow people to be able to project within their financial arrangements how mm -hmm. they're going to live. Mm -hmm. If you tell me what you'll be paying and your financial capacity uh, and purchase power in three years, how it will be, you can't say, because you do not know. You do not know how the tax regime is going to settle. So the work of parliament, therefore, is not to change tax brackets every time there is a taxation cycle. Mm -hmm. So that every year we expect VAT gets changed and so on and so on. We must settle that. Mm -hmm. So there's predictability. What we lack here is predictability. I, you, you, can't, you can't therefore settle on investment. Mm -hmm. The other issue, I think, in that context on matters taxation mm -hmm. is we must be able to agree. Are we taxing to develop? Or are we going to be um, are we going to be patient enough mm -hmm. to allow people to grow uh, and have capacity to pay more taxes by giving them incentives such as low taxation and other incentives mm -hmm. for purposes of growing themselves and growing the sector such as agriculture, tourism? Because we've seen that this intensity in in trying to get f uh, quick fixes hasn't helped us. Look at tourism. I can tell you. Tourism is at its lowest, no matter how we look at it. Mm -hmm. And our competing destinations are doing better. Zanzibar, Mozambique, South Africa, in Africa, uh, Tanzania, even Uganda. Mm -hmm. they, they are growing. Even, even, even Rwanda has become robust in, in its attraction for tourism and, and has 
basically advertises gorillas and, and it gets what it wants. Mm -hmm. Number two, and Egypt is a destination that is taking over from us and so on and so forth. Look at, for instance, uh, manufacturing. Companies are leaving the country because of the environment we are imposing in them, including unpredictable taxation environment. So we must be patient enough to say the growth will come, but we need to subject the people to environment so that they can get education, they can grow, and therefore eventually we reach where we want. If we want to move um, because we want a legacy of a regime, we want to be seen to be big, big, doing big things, that's what the people are asking for. Mm -hmm. In any event, Kenyans have never asked anyone to do big things for them. Mm -hmm. They've asked them to provide environment so that they live in a dignified manner, including imposing taxation and tax regimes that are affordable. Mm -hmm. I, I think that is not too much to ask from any region. Mm -hmm. So when you get there, don't, I think it's not to think forward and say, I want to be this great man uh, so that when I leave, I've done this and this. I, I think I agree with what my good friend has said. Mm -hmm. Do not consume too much uh, that, than, that, than you, can, you can chew. Not buy too much than you can chew. I think make available for the people that environment in a context for them to thrive. And then you'll get where you want, including the fact that we'll remember you for making life affordable for the people. That's an achievement. Yes. The, making life affordable for the people is a big achievement than the roads that you build uh, and probably airports that you build, mm -hmm. I think. Doctor, you want yeah, to... Okay, I, I want to say something. Yeah. You know the problem we have in this country is that we do not have familiarity a lot about this taxation. Uh, familiarity like in the sense that, um, you know, it's like uh, you remove money from this pocket and they put it here. You know, when you talk about you lower, is it to halt the pay or to to lower the the the, the tax for pay? Mm -hmm. uh, what did what the, 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 the CS said that the government is considering uh, lowering, lowering pay as you earn within a period of two years. Yeah. So you see what I'm saying? Eh? The biggest problem we have in this country, mm -hmm. Kenyans, by the way, especially the lower and the middle class, they pay tax. Because you see people operating businesses, they really don't want this uh, cat and mouse, this cat and mouse business, especially with the carry people, especially with the county government. Are you saying? Mm -hmm. I, I believe that's how the government generates its money. But there's a bit of opaqueness. Are you saying like now the expressway? Mm -hmm. I, I see money is uh, being collected. I see, you know, we have, uh, you know, we don't even understand what does the 16% VAT in the first case what is the collection of 16% uh, VAT collection and what does it do? Which amount pays? Who? You know, there's so much that we we want to have familiarity. Mm -hmm. Kenyans don't have familiarity because now if I'm not familiar with something, I make many assumptions. Mm -hmm. And uh, number two, I can say anything about it because I feel like I'm ambushed. How can the Kenyan government make it possible for Kenyans to understand what is happening? You know, not, not, not like the Mamambogas. They, they, they think the 16% is stealing their money. They, let them understand how are civil servants paid? How are who paid? Mm -hmm. what, what is happening? You know, when uh, at least there's an environment of familiarity, they, we can reduce this kind of pessimism. Mm -hmm. However much we are struggling, and I know the president is also struggling on his own, mm -hmm. because he didn't find this country, he found this country in pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what the country Kenya is undergoing right now, it is because of historical issues. It is, they don't start with the Ruto, it started with other regimes. Not even with Uhuru himself, with the other regimes. But everything is banked on him. But Kenyans have not had that space to also give him that type of understanding that he came in and found a tattered house. And you see this pumping this right and left. But the people, because he has ministers concerned and the PSAs, they should be within their context, play their roles within their context, and at most, let Kenyans understand what does 16% VAT do, what does what do, what does what do, what are these debts that we have, mm -hmm. where have, you know, continuous updates. Mm -hmm. And another thing I would like to say, money is collected in this country before they can even want to lower or hire any taxes. Can they make sure if you collect 10 shillings, they are understood it is 10 shillings, and this is their money that is being used. But there are so many loopholes. There are so many, everybody, there are so many loopholes. First, I think, according to me, the government should just concentrate on closing these loopholes. Is it Mianya? These loopholes uh -huh. where money is going. So, you know, if you, I collect 10 shillings, and at the end of the month, 
I'm having two shillings, but somehow because uh, I've put him responsible over a certain docket, mm -hmm. responsible over a certain docket, there's a money that is not coming in. He is my friend. I cannot ask him. I cannot peg him. I cannot raise this because the Kenyans are going to be on him. Are you saying? So I end up, I end up wanting to be comfortable with my two bob mm -hmm. because I also owe him one way or another. Mm -hmm. So if we can, uh, we can have that type of, can we first take care of what is collected mm -hmm. before you decide to lower or hire any mm -hmm. taxes. Mm -hmm. Have you taken care of the 10 shillings you collect in a month? Have you taken care of the, of, of, of the resources? The, you, you know the Kenyan country, it's, you know the, the government, it's also it's a landlord, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yes. You know, all that is not factored in. So all we know, higher taxes, higher what? This money collected, how much is it? How much do we collect in a month? Mm -hmm. Familiarity. Yeah. At least Kenyans can be in a position of uh, reducing the pessimism, yes. the current negative energy among citizens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's my prayer. The, the two panelists have raised very interesting aspects in uh, all this. Uh, Wakili has the matters to do with predictability. And now Daktari uh, has come up with matters to do with familiarity. But also the question, is there a level to which the... Um, the people need to feel that they are comfortably taxed. Banoska? Uh, I mean, all, if, if I summarize what Dr. is reading about predictability and what she's talking about familiarity, yes. I will summarize it in terms of stability. Yeah. That um, people want to be sure of what they are dealing with. For example, that if you buy uh, an insurance, education insurance for your children today, child who is two years old that by the time they get to university by the time they get to secondary when they need to use that money they will still be stable stability you will get value for that money uh -huh. that, that one has been lacking uh -huh. for instance when we have banks interest rates which are fluctuating when bank interest rates are fluctuating then you buy insurance that you're going to expect to use in 10 years and then when you go to withdraw that money so that you take your kid to school the insurance company will tell you, no, there were fluctuations. So although we promise that we will be giving you your, your premium mm -hmm. at 10 percent, we can only afford to give you at 8 percent because we also invested that money in the market. Mm -hmm. And the market where we invested that money is, has a fl it keeps on fluctuating. Sometimes the interest goes up, sometimes the interest goes down. You know, you cannot avoid some of these things. And, uh, for example, you know the interest rate. What, what, for example, what COVID did to our, 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 our systems. Yeah, we, the interest went down and sometimes they were coming up. Yeah. And sometimes they, there's a bullish and bearish uh, type of system. So it's difficult to have that, uh, that type of uh, system. But other steady economies, but it's not anymore anymore. Because, like, for example, the cost of, uh, cost of living now is a global problem. And uh, it's caused by partly the war in Russia and Ukraine and also the wars in Lebanon and, uh, and, and Israel because they affect the, the global trade. They interfere with whatever is happening because we are in one globe and you know, we, are, we are in one market. And anything that happens in one corner affects the other thing that happens in the other corner. But now, you ask me if, is there a time when uh, citizens will feel they are comfortably taxed. I don't think if we can uh, get to that particular time. Although when, for instance, people are able to house themselves, you know, what you want to do, what do you want to achieve? For example, if you work at KBC, I want to drive my car comfortably, I can come with my car mm -hmm. continuously into town, I'll be able to pay it comfortably. You want to be able to pay for your kids' school fees without any struggle, and you want to be able to house, not probably pay rent, build a house for yourself. That is, at that level, when you can achieve those ones comfortably, yeah. as that, those ones are the basic things that sometimes you need as a, in a middle class, a middle class family. Okay. But when you have to have interference in the economy, mm -hmm. which forces you to sell that car and sell that house for, so that you're able to stay afloat, and you know most of the people who were in the middle class dropped down to lower class because of COVID, because people lost jobs, Companies were closing. Now companies are moving out of the country. And what does that cause? The, the ripple effect is that people who have mortgages, who are working in those companies, mm -hmm. have to either let go those mortgages, let go those houses, let go those cars, and start afresh again. So the, that stability is lacking. When that stability lacks, that means the people who are managing the general, mm -hmm. the, the general uh, economy of the country uh, has a problem. They, maybe maybe we're not investing so much on futuristic 
uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. For instance, you know when uh, this guy who is called Elon Musk brings something, this, this safari link thing here, it renders the fi fiber optics that we've been rolling down all this time all useless. And that is what happened to f a company like Telecom. Because Telecom had these analog lines and they had a big network in the country. Mm -hmm. Then we had a company called Safaricom which came up, which was doing the mobile uh, phone. And now all the laid down, the infrastructure was done by Telecom goes under the water. The same way the people were laying fiber optics, they're still laying the fiber optics. Mm -hmm. But we are told that this Safari link that is coming, which is going to provide international, like international Wi-Fi, you can get that Wi-Fi anywhere. That renders all the fiber optics projects and the money that we're investing in fiber optics all useless. Mm -hmm. So we're not really investing in futuristic ideas. We are only investing, we are, we are caught off guard all the time. Somebody said that uh, the development in Africa and the Western world is like a child held a hand by his father who has doing big steps and very stable. But this kid who is being pulled by the dad is very unstable and cannot do and keep up with the father. So anytime he keeps on investing, he, found, he finds that something big has changed and it's moving very fast. So we are putting money on the wrong ideas. It is wrong for us to lay fiber optics now because in the next two years, we won't need them again. But you know, it's a big infrastructure. Some companies are getting into big loans to lay those fiber optics. Mm -hmm. So we need to invest in futuristic ideas. Mm -hmm. And if we invest in futuristic ideas, we it will even go to our educational system because we are churning out university uh, graduates who cannot be able to do anything in the market because the market that they want that we are preparing them for is changing rapidly and we have the traditional way of training which is not in uh, tandem with the contemporary market so there's no time that our people will feel that the unless we, we we have growth yes yes and if we have growth something must give yeah even the development partners and everything. Something must give for us to have growth. Mm -hmm. And at that level, we will find that, okay, the taxation is not bad. People are not worried about it. The country that tax 50%. But you see, 50% of taxation, but what is the government doing? You find the social uh, benefit system is so huge. People who are not working are paid salaries. The that. systems there work. The systems work. Are supposed to here. And I think that is one of the problems the that Kenyans raise systems. in terms of where are these taxes going. Isn't that true? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I, I think I that was my argument mm -hmm. in the sense that yeah. what is this money doing? Where mm -hmm. is it going? How much is it? You know? Yeah. yeah. You see, see, and again, the other day I was here, I was talking about that. Some of the things that we have a problem, which have failed, for example, the church. The church have, has failed to provide people with basic moral capital. Those a country without values. If we want to sit down and discuss about femicide, where are women being killed, for example? Give me right. Corruption that we talk about every day. Why are people whom we put in office as experts mm -hmm. end up just looting the money and using it for completely different things? You know, when you loot Kemsa, you know you're looting on what? Mm -hmm. When you loot nets, we are supposed to help people with malaria. When you loot money that is meant for HIV, for HIV patients, ARVs, when you bring in looting to that level, that means that we are living in a society that has completely gone rogue, a, a completely that has no values mm -hmm. for anything, and the moral capital needs to be put in place mm -hmm. by the clergy, the church, who I blame for where we are because <laughs> at the beginning you got us here. You, you got us here because... Let me, let me, let me say this. Eh? Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Okay, no um, church is uh, an integral part of society, so uh, are religious institutions. Mm -hmm. But church does not legislate. Church is not society. The sum total of society mm -hmm. is uh, the general side that brings Kenyans together. And I don't think the church brings Kenyans together. It is part of the component of the many facets that compose the Kenyan society. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Okay. I, was, I was in Japan about three weeks ago mm -hmm. or a month ago. One thing I learned is that there is a year, one whole year in primary school where nothing else is taught except morals in class. So it's not English, it's not Swahili, it's not mathematics, it's not anything else. You are taught morals. 
you are taught why when it's red light you must stop and allow it to give you time to give you time to be green for you to walk and why when you're driving it's red you must stop whether there's traffic or there's no traffic you will be taught why after eating your banana you must throw and dispose at an appropriate place and why when you open the sweet and you take the sweet it is your responsibility to keep that which has wrapped the sweet in your pocket until you get home so when you get to a supermarket and that was strange for me mm -hmm. so i bought something i want to eat so i eat of course the kenyan way now i want a place to dispose it <laughs> zero there's no place there's no dustbin then i see a notice saying carry your trash home carry your trash home so if you buy anything whatever is disposable after you use is your responsibility so if you walk in the street, in the streets you don't see plastic you don't see anything so we went to we went to our well, well let me put this we went to a world cup competition mm -hmm. where i was participating after the competition i go back to the stadium there is nothing nothing including spillovers on the seats there was of course ice cream there was everything but those spillovers people have wiped their seats now we don't need the church to do that because a whole year in primary school is dedicated to morals so you don't legislate on morals no you legislate on control of conduct and behavior however I asked them, is there a law that says if you throw trash this way, you're going to pro get prosecuted? No. It doesn't even say, you see here, we say, uh, you know, yeah. we'll prosecute you. Mm -hmm. There, it doesn't, the, the, the notice doesn't say if you throw trash, we're going to prosecute you. No. It simply says, carry your trash home. And, and those little things are a build up to the general um, behavior of society. So much so that if you accuse of a minister in Japan, for instance, of embezzlement of funds, that a direct resignation, especially if there's evidence. But number two, some even commit suicide but on account of that accusation. You know why? The build-up towards um, the moral edifice that then organized society is not because you have a position. It is because you were taught to do it. In African context, before we became Kenya, mm -hmm. we were small communities in our ethnicity. Yeah. But it will be condemnable, for instance, to be seen you know, doing a certain act that's abominable then. Mm -hmm. In fact, we will probably have to cleanse yes. the society on account of something you've done, yes. uh, which is abominable. So the context is, are we there yet? I think it's more of the training of the Kenyan society All right. than the debate because church is not going to go away and bad behavior is not going to go away All until right. we instill it. Yes. I think I, think I need to... No, 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 no. We, and we'll come back to that after we go for a short break. Okay. Uh, we'll be right back. Don't go too far. Okay. They take a whole year to put on my day. Thank you for tuning in to Good Morning Kenya. We continue with this conversation. And Wakili, you are talking about something to do with morals and the, uh, uh, the moral aspect of um, what was you uh, witnessed taught in Japan. Yes. If you can continue on that point. And, and what I was saying, therefore, I think the, the, the cutaway would be that morals are taught. They're not supposed... It can be that by default they should be ingrained in you mm -hmm. And passively, probably taught to you on Sunday in church, mm -hmm. where the context, in fact, now is the commercial aspect of, uh, of, of the religious movement in this mm -hmm. country. So, yes, the churches are, will, are supposed to be doing a good thing mm -hmm. to moralize the, 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 the country. But that can be a universal application yeah. because, I mean, you, have, you cannot say that when you go to church first, you have to listen to what the pastor is saying. Yes. You, you can listen and behave in a good manner on Sunday or within the environment of the church after that, you become a Kenyan citizen. Mm -hmm. And you have a whole week on how to behave. Number two is not all people go to, to, to church. So church cannot be the beholden institution that then in, in, induces 
um, imbues good, good behavior in society. It can't be left to the church. Mm -hmm. It must be taught. We speak English because we were taught English, and good English for that matter. We speak Swahili because we were taught Swahili. We know mathematics because we were taught. Mm -hmm. When you are taught, it is pumped into you such a way that it becomes part and parcel of who you are in terms of your output. If morals, therefore, are taught in the context of the subjects that we have mm -hmm. in this country, it becomes part of you, and therefore it is an output that lives with you. And therefore, even if we legislate, or in the context of legislation, you can't legislate on everything, there are certain moral aspects that will be an output of the society because they were taught to the people. We don't teach ethics. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't pump ethics into people's and children's hearts yeah. and uh, part of our education yeah. on account of probably the um, argument on convenience of how many subjects should be available to be taught. But if we did it, generationally, we will be able to have an improvement on the general national psyche and how we handle uh, public property. The last thing I want to tell you is this. There's a principle in law which we say that that which belongs to all belongs to none. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you see, when you have a context of what is public, you have no moral drive to protect it because it seems to be for everyone. That which is yours, and the emotion you have to your car and a public vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, those are two different things. Yeah. But the day that we learn that which is public is also as good as private mm -hmm. on account of the fact that we are the ones who bought it, it is ours and should be taken care of. And then we go to above the normal, um, uh, the normal interaction with public affairs with a distance to our emotions mm -hmm. and our general psyche I think that's an advancement. Yes. So it means, therefore, we must know in the first place that that which is public is ours. We must protect it. But when you're administering public affairs, mm -hmm. you must do it because you understand uh, morally you are called upon as a higher calling to administer that for the private citizen of the country. Yes. First, you're a private citizen yourself and that you're doing it for the private citizen. I think we need to get there, but we'll do it if it is put into context of education mm -hmm. and it is taught to us. If we leave it to the church, mm -hmm. I think we'll be trying harder. We mm -hmm. should be trying harder to have everyone go to church every day and that we have to do exams in church for purposes of instilling the morals uh, in our national psyche. Oscar, you wanted to add something? Yeah, about. you know, um, the one brought about the, this, this debate about uh, moral capital that's supposed to be provided by the church. Yes. Simply because for the first time I'm seeing the church coming hard on government, which I've missed for many years. When we lost, where did we lose the clergy? Mm -hmm. You know, we had the guitarists of this world. We had Bishop Mugi of this world. We had Okulu of this world, who always came hard on the state. Why? Because even at the first century, the church felt they were above the state in terms of control. Mm -hmm. And now that is, well, at the first century, again, I think the church has the responsibility to give guidance to society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as much as uh, he's talking about that we need to be taught. Yes, so I was taught in Sunday school. The Sunday school should be there, and people should be taught in Sunday school. The morals that mm -hmm. we saw in Sunday school are not necessarily the things we were taught in school when we were in class one. Because when we were in class one, on weekdays, Monday to Friday, we went to formal school. But on Saturday and Sunday, SDA and, 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 and other people who are Christians went to Sunday school. In that Sunday school, there were morals that were being taught, which we got to learn at that level, which I completely agree. I still think that the church has, the, clearly the church has to teach internal truth, for example. They have that moral obligation, internal truth. They are the only people who can stand with the truth today, mm -hmm. tomorrow, even when things are so hard on people. Get me right? Mm -hmm. I still don't think that even the abductions that we're talking about the, the state has the courage to, uh, to abduct uh, or lesser pit or to abduct <laughs> some of these, uh, some of these uh, clergymen, even what they say. Mm -hmm. Give it right. As opposed to what I say in TV, I can walk out of this TV station and then when I get to the gate, somebody picks me and then you, um, yes, Oscar is just lost after that TV yeah. interview. But if the people who are men of the clergy are picked and abducted, it will be a big thing. 
So the state cannot go against them. So they have the moral authority, the moral intent to, to stand with the truth. Unfortunately, unfortunately, of late, the clergy have been part of repeating the sloganeering of the political system. They should be ahead of uh, politics. Mm -hmm. They should be the people who sit up there and then politicians down there. But they've come down. Last week and the other previous week, I saw them coming hard. My friend Godia said that they threatened even to declare a curse on corrupt leaders. That we will declare a curse on them. Why are they having that position of thinking that they can declare a curse on somebody? Right? This is what's supposed to happen. Because we want to deal with the moral decay. Mm -hmm. We want to deal with moral decay. Last week, I was in a funeral of lost a friend who was a manager at Wells Fargo. Yeah. And one of the mourners who was speaking on front said that the Luo, our people, the killings like this one, this is not, is an archaic to the Luo community. Mm -hmm. We, I, I mean, you can rob, but just taking somebody's blood, this is not something that is taboos of our people do this. So I'm saying the problem that we have, we've lost morals. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, for example, if ESCC worked, because we're looking at that integrity, chapter 6, yes. if ESCC worked properly, nobody or a quarter of people in this parliament could have not even gotten tickets to get to, to, get to those positions. Mm -hmm. So that the ESCC didn't, it was just stamping. Mm -hmm. People with corruption cases, <laughs> people with what, they went into parliament. But, but these people, uh, if you subject them to check into the, whatever they've made, the money they've made, morally, it is wrong. So we've lost morals, and now it's coming to our youth. For example, I'm talking about still the church. How do you explain that in Wajia or in Mandera, they don't have an alcoholic problem among the youth? It is because of religion. It is because of religion. It is because of the, the relationship of religion to alcohol. Mm -hmm. yeah, but they have a problem with uh, yes, Moguka. Uh, with other problems. Yeah, problem. And I'm good. talking about alcohol now. I'm not talking about Moguka. Moguka is also an alcohol. It's not alcohol. It's not alcohol. I'm talking, about, I'm, talking a, a, I'm talking about alcohol, which we have a problem with, mostly in central Kenya. Again, if, <laughs> we, if, if we have a problem with Mogoka, oh no, if I have a discussion of Mogoka, they have a serious problem with Mogoka, which I completely agree. But now again, what I'm saying, that religion plays a very big part mm -hmm. in uh, morality of society, yeah. which if you leave it to government, people yeah. in government, and we say politics are dirty game, pastors, if they come into politics and continue sloganeering, and even when the Genesis were revolting, one of the things that the Genesis said, we don't like it when we see our politicians address congregation and give money to the churches. Mm -hmm. You get me right? Yeah. We should just ban those Arambis. Okay, for the one, for the, for the one that was in, uh, in, in, in Soweto, where President money has to be returned, I think that was done in a bad faith because those people asked. And uh, he gave you them know, money. Either, uh, but no, there, was no, wait, there was no evidence, according to me, that that money that Sakaja and President Ruto gave out was proceeds of corruption. But I know that churches have received money, which, if traced back, could be proceeds of corruption. Mm -hmm. And they've enjoyed going into bed with politicians. But politics are dirty game. People in politics have dirty things, dirty money. And unless <laughs> we have a system where the religious section of society will rise up to the occasion and think, be um, the owners of internal truth. Then we can have deal with corruption, deal with things that shift and say the truth when it needs, needs to happen. Yes. You see, yes. what I want to say is, you have really explained about the church being involved. Uh -huh. I, don't, I think everybody, when it comes to a moral fabric, Everybody should be involved, including you, I'm as somebody's I'm, father. I'm saying guidance. I'm saying Yo, guidance. guidance. That's okay. You, you're also supposed to start from your home. I, I Charity agree. begins at home. Okay. We are not going uh, to bag <laughs> this thing into Let me cut you just short. on the religious aspect alone. L Let me cut, cut you short. We cross over to the CBD where Alan Aoko is uh, stationed uh, right now. These are uh, trying to get the views of the Kenyans regarding what the president is uh, going to address in parliament later on. Uh, uh, later today at 2.30 p.m. Uh, we can cross over to Alan Aogo who is in CBD. Over to you, Alan. A very good morning to you this very chilly Nairobi morning here at the CBD in Nairobi. 
Indeed, we are sampling views of the state of the nation. We came here early in the morning just to see the mood of Kenyans at this time. You remember, uh, today is that day when the president will have to talk to Kenyans and tell them the state of the nation this afternoon at the parliament buildings. But uh, let us also just listen to a few Kenyans to tell us what they expect the president to say and how the state of the nation is according to them. Uh, welcome, sir. Maybe you can start by telling Telling us your name and uh, what to do and uh, what is the state of the nation according to you and maybe tell us what do you expect uh, the president to tell us uh, today afternoon. Uh, okay, kwa majina naitwa Professor, ama naitwa James Professor. Okay, mimi ni kwa aji wa hapa Nairobi. Na tumekuja hapa eh, kutafuta uh, riziki. Na by the way tumetembea uh, uh, ujumi ni mbaya na tunataka uh, president at least haongee kitu ambayo inaweza kutusaidia sisi kama wananchi uh, kila kitu iko juu ujumi iko juu vyakula siko juu kila kitu generally iko juu so tunataka yeye hatupe matumaini na tuelezee chinsi ambavyo hizi vitu sitashuka sita chini ndio at least na sisi tuweze kuishi maisha ya kawaida na kila ambacho ninaomba rais haweze kutuelezea ni kwamba uh, uh, atuelezee jinsi ambavyo tunaweza kaa na amani sisi kama wananchi kwa jumla kwa sababu tunasikia kwa, uh, uh, kila mahali ya kwamba kuna watu ambao wameuliwa ndio at least na sisi tukue na security ya kutosha ndio Mm. Uh, kulingana na vile aw awali uh, nchi ilikuwa unaona labda hata mahali tuko saizi tutaweza ku, uh, kufaulu uh, na uchumi vile inasemekana sasa hii inaimarika uh, na asilimia uh, uh, saba Okay kulingana na mambo ya ujumi uchumi bado iko juu na mahali tunaelekea tunaelekea mahali kubaya sana Sasa kila ambacho tunastahili kufanya ni kwamba Jeje kama kiongozi wetu yeye ndio huwa anafaa kutuelezea chinze ambavyo eh, i uchumi itakavyo kuwa sasa siku za mbeleni ndio Asante sana kwa kutuongelesha. Wacha pia tuongeleshe mwenzetu mwingine kijana. Uh, don't know English or Swahili. Uh, Swahili, yeah. Just tell us your name and uh, what you do and talk to us, talk to Kenyans. Tell them how you feel the economy is and what do you expect the president uh, to say this afternoon? Okay, uh, kwa majina naitwa Sarangutu Dennis. Uh, mi ni mfanyikazi tu hapa Nairobi kupambana tu ku hustle. Uh, kitu imeleta hapa hivi leo tulikuwa tumepanga maandamano wazi msikia rais leo anaenda kupitisha ile mkataba ya nini ya finance bill si tumekamku reject juu naona hiyo nini atuoni kama itatupeleka mbali aisaidie wa Kenya uh, leo leo anakuja kuotobia Kenya hali ya uchumi hakuji uh, ku, kupitisha mkataba ya finance bill yeah. Yeah. so kitu na expect aongelee ni kustu asolie vijana manzi tunateseka manzi mtu kama mimi sasa nimekuja street uh, sina sina kitu ya kufanya kijani nimeona tu Chani kama chill chill street alafu ndo dimake jani. Asante sana kwa kutuongelesha. Yes, uh, as you've heard there from Sudo, that uh, are just some of the sentiments of Kenyans here this morning. Uh, of course, we'll be pitching tent here uh, throughout the afternoon as well before the president takes uh, the podium. But we'll be sampling more Kenyans here. And of course, uh, also, maybe if we can also get some businesses or two just to give us a feel of how businesses are doing. It's a mixed bag. Uh, some businesses have been reporting uh, good earnings, especially this week and uh, past few weeks, especially when you look at banking institutions, many of them saying that Kenyans are depositing more. Uh, some of them saying perhaps maybe they are worried that their cash is not safe. That's why they're depositing. We've seen even as late as last evening some banks reporting good money. But small businesses seem to be uh, pointing out that they're still suffering and struggling. And of course, there are some of the people who will want to hear the president say something about the economic climate for them, especially uh, since uh, small businesses account for 80 percent of labor in this country and they are a big engine for the economy here in Kenya. Of course, we'll get that to you as soon as we can. But for now, back to you in studio.
indeed that is alan aoko who is joining us from the central business district talking to kenyans concerning the state of the nation address that is supposed to happen later on in the day at parliament buildings and one of the things that have been said by one of the uh, person who have been, who has been interviewed is that he's expecting the president to, in his speech to give hope i don't know dr Terry, what do you think about that yeah, I think he's very right. The level of joblessness in this country is so alarming. Mm -hmm. And then, then what you want, you know, these commissions, 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 I think a commission should be formed also, which is noble, to address the level of joblessness in this country. Mm -hmm. How can you create jobs? How can you make it easy even for foreign investors to come and invest here to give these children jobs? Because you see, they've gone to school, they come back, uh, they are just in the house. Are you saying? Mm -hmm. And then most slogans in the t in the past they used to say like um, education is the key to success. You know, I don't think that thing has ever gotten out of mindsets, mm -hmm. eh? out of um, uh, mindsets. Uh, of course, it's nice to be educated, but also our children have also taken it up in the sense that. Um, when I have a degree, I have to be able to get certain amount of money. They, 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 they equate education to money. Mm -hmm. They do not uh, edu ed uh, equate it to in the sense that when you are educated, it's better when you are not because even if you're going to have money, you're going to know how to manage it. You're going to know how to manage yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, many other things. I agree too much. Uh, the cost of living, um, sure it's, and then you get confused. You know, like we used to buy unga at a certain amount. Mm -hmm. Now it comes down, you still can't see the difference. There's just something that is ailing in this country that uh, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. It is high, it is low. I think there's just something that is happening that, um, uh, that is not... Uh, somebody else cracked a joke that somebody employed or not employed, uh, they all are having the same struggle. I, I don't know that you have heard of that. And then I, I would say, I, I think among the issues in this country primarily should be, one, uh, the health sector, two, education sector, three, joblessness, the joblessness of uh, the Kenyan young people. Yeah. I aim uh, to reduce the, um, the retirement age so that we can have fresh blood and then to also kind of have some kind of directives to, to private se the private sector who are having the business in this country. Mm -hmm. So that you see now like the AGPO, the 30% for, you know, you know, like the tenders, to be uh, the, the employers to to, to have some regulations like you know you, you know of, of course even if you're, you're, i'm going to have my company i'll look at uh, mostly my relatives and stuff doesn't matter if we can have some regulation that we can have in every private company be it in the health sector wherever place be it in education to have 30 percent of the gen z's mm -hmm. you know the gen z's the age starts from uh, what age are these Gen Z's? Is it from 18, 18 to? 18 to 20. 25. 35. Yeah. 35, eh? Yeah. From there we go to millennial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Gen Z's, if we can have 30% as a regulation, as a rule, as a law in this country, we are going to reduce the joblessness in this country because if we are going to rely on them being absorbed in the government, all of them, mm -hmm. and the government currently, I think it is choked with the wage bill, yeah. that is going to make the difference. If the government can just promise us in this in his report, can promise us some of these pertinent issues categorically, injecting answers and hope to Kenyans, mm -hmm. the health, the Ministry of Health, Education, joblessness in this in this country mm -hmm. and then i was trying also to say something about you talked of the social uh, the the moral fabric mm -hmm. you know in our in our education or like uh, wakili has, has rightfully said about japan how they you see they are developed yeah. we have never asked ourselves as a country why are we still developing after so long we are still a developing country yeah. developing country it's because our systems are all compromised because you see now like the life skills the president yesterday was talking about uh, having a caravan. He has put uh, like 100,000, 100 million. million aside to take care of, of the caravans. You are not, I am not going to listen to your issues at a close level. You know, we cannot generalize issues. But the life skills that was being taught in school yeah. it was, um, uh, was uh, like absorbed in other subjects. Yeah. It, it's not treated as a main subject. We have very many guiding and counseling uh, experts in this country who do not know which sector they're supposed to go. They should go and look for them jobs. Okay. Why can't the government take mental health as a very important aspect? Mm -hmm. Because 
Kenyans are sick. The president is, is leading sick people. Yeah. And then we, we are sick, we do not know we are sick. Yes. We know, you know, you know, we are operating in such a sense that we do not take your mental state. You know, if, if mentally you are not okay, yeah. you know, that is why even our children as they grow up, you know, when they reach maybe to high school, they are going to uh, university, there is nobody who tells them how to handle the dating game, how to realize, how to, how, how to notice a risky behavior of someone you're dealing with. Okay. Our children are on social media. They do not know how to physically deal with people. You know, when I see you, I'll see your body language. I, the way you look at me, is this person dangerous? But we always, you know, you see them even on, uh, everybody's on social media. Right. They do not know how to deal with human beings they see mm -hmm. physically. I want to get your sentiments on um, what the, the two gentlemen have said. And the issue of jobs has always been a thorn yeah. in the flesh, in the yeah. fewest of words possible. <laughs> your reactions well, to whatever has Before I react to that, yes. I just heard actually talk about Kenyans being sick. I didn't realize that we are all sick. Maybe we need to close the country <laughs> and get a, therapy, and get a therapist maybe to counsel us. Eh? But anyway, uh, issues of joblessness. Yes. What I can discuss is how has this regime, because today we are having, he is discussing it because there will be a state of nation address. Yes. And uh, he's reacting or he's looking at what he expects the president to discuss in the state of union address. Yes. So he expects the president to say something to help his situation, right? Now, what has the president done or what has the, the regime done to deal with joblessness since it came into power? That is the two, two, two years that we had. Like, and is it working? Mm -hmm. For instance, there have been this thing of uh, the president going abroad to look for jobs and all this. You know, he has done that. And there are many people who have traveled abroad to look for that. That means that, oh, okay, for the last two years, mm -hmm. the percentage that has benefited from that type of idea could be one percent mm -hmm. or two percent. That mm -hmm. means it doesn't really help the percentage of joblessness we have in the country, yeah. which we are now. We, I think we must be at either forty or or, or fifty percent, mm -hmm. or even more than that now. Countries like uh, welfare states like Sweden and Denmark, I think, are still at fourteen percent. Yeah. America is could be like twenty percent, but we could be at sixty percent. So that means that unemployment. There's, there are two things also. There's unemployment and underemployment, uh -huh. where you have a station where you've, you have learned so much. Among these young people, I think they have so much knowledge, yeah. even if you give them jobs, most of the time they get underemployed because they have so much talent that when you give them, for example, if you give whatever the jobs that are being looked for abroad, what are the jobs, what, are, what jobs are they getting, like domestic workers? You know, some of these guys who go to go do domestic work jobs yes. are university degree uh, graduates. Uh -huh. So if you go and get him a job uh, to work as a domestic worker, you've really underemployed this person. You've given them jobs, yes, but Shauri Amoyo, uh -huh. you know, there's not the job that they want to do. Okay. So what have, needs to happen? First of all, for you to build an economy, uh -huh. make sure that unskilled people, yes. unskilled people in your state have something to do. Uh -huh. This group that is skilled, the ones, with, the ones with the degrees and the ones with the master's degree can take care of themselves. Uh -huh. But the unskilled one, the Juakali sector, we have to do radical policy changes. Yes. For example, importation of this finished good from China, it's going to kill just the local industry. Develop the Juakali sector, because uh -huh. even whatever we do in the Juakali sector, the carpenters, the whatever, and the, and the, and the, the people who do those hand jobs should be able to be able to work. Uh -huh. And how do you do that? Is developing, putting intentionally, yes. putting funds into that sector, uh -huh. giving in loans and grants yeah. to the, that sector, developing TVT so that we produce a lot of plumbers, a lot of mechanics, a lot of uh, masonry, a lot of people who are doing that type of stuff. But the more we bring in stuff which are finished from China, at the end of the day, okay. we just shrink in the job opportunities that we have for our young people. Mm -hmm. If you call for a rally, don't even, don't even, you don't even have, nowadays, police do not call for rallies. Gashako just needs to drive into CBD, and within two minutes, it's full. People are not working. Rally Dinga needs just to go drive into Uhuru Park, and within two minutes, it's full, because these people are not working. The population you see in those rallies is so big. When you had the JNC's, conf the JNC's revolution here, the population that deserted the town, you will be asked, where have these people been? And are all these people not working? Yes. And why are we have serious problems like the Mogokai is talking about mm -hmm. and the alcoholic problem? Yes. These are the repercussions of unemployment. Okay. But now what we have to do mm -hmm. is like Trump says, he thinks about America. Close borders, 
Everybody who is bringing things from China, stop it. Let's have jobs here. Anybody who's taking jobs out, bring it back to the country because we need it here. Okay. I think okay. we need jobs back to the country okay. and we can do it. Wakili, uh, take it uh, as a closing mark, react to whatever was said by those two gentlemen. Well, th there is the argument of legitimate expectation, yeah. being that um, when you go to school, yeah. you are endowed to a bracket of comfort uh, that is promised of, of you by government, by society. Mm -hmm. We create people um, behavior as a society by in the matter, in, in the manner in which we interact with them. Suffice it to say therefore that if we educate a person using yeah. our resources, mm -hmm. we must then go to the extra mile of providing an environment for that person to work and provide for himself. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, then we are guilty, uh, uh, we are guilty to that person on account of what should be expected of society. Mm -hmm. Two, government responsibility, by whatever means, must go to the extra mile of providing opportunities for people to, Im to be employed or to employ themselves. Yeah. Meaning, therefore, uh, create jobs, on, uh, either from the private sector or public sector. Mm -hmm. And lastly, the joblessness is also um, an indication of one sector uh, working and another sector not working, complementing the sector that is working. For instance, the education sector has improved by yes. and large by producing graduates yes. and people endowed with knowledge. However, the environment or the arm of government or whatever environment ought to subsist, that which then increases the availability of jobs and opportunities is not available. Mm -hmm. And that disconnect is what is bringing all these problems. Yes. Therefore, at the production level of uh, the graduates and people and youth from yeah. uh, school must be complemented by whatever means. I, I agree yes. that uh, the government has done a lot in terms of um, trying to address this issue. Mm -hmm. It's just that one, it may not be uh, complementing the opportunities versus what is available yeah. as a resource, human resource. Okay. And number two, it's just it's not doing enough yes. to enhance that environment and capacity to be able to absorb. If that is done, I believe we're going to improve uh, the structures. It can be done that we can do that by ordinarily uh, attracting foreign direct investment, mm -hmm. and number two, by uh, making capital available in the pockets of Kenyans mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to invest, and number three, making funds available. That's what Kibaki did largely. Um, interests are low, and people can borrow. And therefore, you do not have, for instance, to say, I am organizing um, uh, what you call affordable housing, and those units are going to employ people. It should be that the private sector is doing affordable housing, yeah. and therefore, people get employed with the private sector. A good, uh, the ideal of a government, therefore, should not even engage in business itself. Mm -hmm. If you provide the environment in a, um, an ideal capitalistic environment, will be that the private sector thrives and therefore society thrives because then um, the production of the human resource is complemented with opportunities that are available uh, to the human resource available. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, thank you so much for making time to come on Good Morning Kenya and talk about various issues affecting the nation. That is Oscar Wanyango, a political analyst, Dr. Evelyn Ogendo, who is also a political analyst, and Wakili George Kithi, advocate of the High Court, and also a political analyst joining us here on Good Morning Kenya. This is where we uh, cap this conversation. My name is Mike. Maybe we don't go too far. Vivian Dengua is up next with more. Good morning.